Now, let me tell you what God, God's response. You know what it says, I should tell you. Go to Numbers 14, 28, New Living Translation. Numbers 14, 28. This is God's response to the words that you've spoken. Want to go? Now, tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things that I heard you say. Come on. Give him a shout of praise. Clap your hands, all you people. Blessing and honor. And honor. Blessings and honor. Glory and power, Glory and power. Be, unto be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, From every nation. All, of creation. all of creation, bow before the sing that I sang that song was because during swap we had a revelation of God as what the ancient of days and you know every time God reveals himself in a dimension that means he wants to manifest that dimension to us amen I'm not going to go into the long read because we find that name of God that expression of God in Daniel 7 so when you get home you know, do yourself a favor to read through Daniel 7 in multiple um, translations. But I'm going to read from verse 22 to 27. It may not have a lot of context, but if you've read the scripture before, you would understand. It's a, it's a passage of scripture that speaks to the end time prophecy. So a lot of the things that are happening in the nations of the earth right now, you know, are I mean, can be seen in that scripture. The kingdoms, the four beasts that you see in Daniel 7 represent four kingdoms. The, the ten horns speak of ten kings or maybe presidents. You know, the nations there represent real nations in our world. Okay, so it's, it's really a prophetic picture of the end time. However, there's always a spiritual meaning. Say spiritual meaning. Okay, and maybe a, a, a practical application in our own lives. By spiritual meaning, I mean that 
while a, 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 a picture can speak to you know a bigger picture it can bear some semblance to our present realities amen so let's read Daniel 7 from verse 20 to 22 and pray that amen and and see you know the 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 operation of the ancient of days so like I said go home and read so you have a clearer context by the way you know somewhere in that passage of scripture you find out that he was seated on the throne and it was like a flaming fire and from the throne issued rivers of fire amen so let's read one to go and of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell even of that horn that had eyes and of mouth that speak very great things whose look was more stout stop I said the new living translation new living translation please want to go and I asked about the ten horns on the fourth beast and the little horn that came up afterward destroyed three of the other horns human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly as I watched this horn was waging war against God's holy people and was defeating them can you imagine stop this horn was waging war against God's holy people not just people the elect, the saved. And the Bible says he was what? When the Bible says we are what? More than what? So this is, this is a misnomer. This is an abomination. That darkness will prevail against light. But watch what, what happens. I hope you know that the ancient of days is also the son of God. Yeshua. Amen. If you check Revelations chapter 1 verse 14 and 15 you see the same description of him in Daniel 7 having white hair you know as wool his eyes like fire now what happened verse 22 until say until the ancient one all the ancient of days the most high came and judged in favor of his holy people then the time arrived for the holy people to take over. You're going to pray whatever represents that stubborn horn in your life. That seems to, you know, every area of your life is going well, but there's this place that you seem to be experiencing defeat. It may just be an addiction. You love God. You know, you're experiencing His freedom, His liberty in every other area, but there's a certain area of your life that seems to just not make a headway. You're going to call on the ancient of days to proclaim judgment against that horn and proclaim judgment in your favor. Are you ready to pray? Say, Father, Father the ancient of days, ancient of days I, declare I declare favor. favor. I declare, I declare judgment, judgment against, against that area of my life that, of my life that seems to be in defeat. I declare judgment against that horn, against that adversary that seems to defeat me. Open your mouth and pray. I come against you in the name of Jesus, the ancient one, the most high, and I declare favor. Ask him to declare you favor. Every horn in my life looking to prevail against me pronounce judgment against them 
and pronounce favor for me. You are the ancient of days. For someone here, it may be something in your bloodline, something in your family, something your father fought, something your mother fought. Ancient of days, arise. Come on, pray. Pray for your family. Say, come and judge in my favor. On behalf of my family, judge in my favor. On behalf of Nigeria, ancient of days, judge in my favor. In my place of work, judge in my favor. In my business, judge in my favor. Pronounce judgment against every stubborn issue. Thirty more seconds. Pray in the name of Jesus, the ancient of days. Someone clap your hands now. Judge in favor of the oasis. Pronounce judgment against every stubborn heart. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. That that scripture really makes a lot of sense. You know, he says, please go to verse 21. As I watched, the horn was waging war against God's holy people and was defeating them. When I read that, that struck me. Defeating those who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And like I said, this is a prophetic picture, but it can bear semblance to issues in our lives. Where the Spirit of the Lord is what? There is what? There's freedom. However, sometimes in our lives, we may experience bondage in certain areas. Until, say until. until. The ancient of days. Say we overcame. Okay. By the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of our testimony. And by the word of our testimony. And then he says came and judged in favor of his holy people. Then the time arrived. Then the time arrived. Somebody say, my time has come. Say, my time has come. My time has come. To be free and free indeed. Make that into a prayer. Whatever that time represents in your life. Because of the intervention of the ancient of days. Nigeria's time has come to be free from corruption. To be free from bondage. My time has come to be free from bondage. Our time has come. Our time has come. In Jesus, mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. As we have spoken in his ears, so shall it be. Amen. I mean, this story is true of our nation, Nigeria. Doesn't it appear like with a lot of churches, a lot of spiritual activity going on, with a lot of such gifted men and women and sound of worship flowing from Nigeria, our reality seems 
opposite to what we profess. Right? Almost making, you know, our faith questionable. Because people say, okay, if really God is this to you people, so why are you faced with all of this? Kidnapping, terrorism, corruption. Until the ancient of this came. Let that until come for Nigeria. Yeah. One more time, let's pray. Say, Father. Father. You are the ancient of days. You are the ancient of days. Judge in favor of Nigeria. Judge in favor of Nigeria. And pronounce judgment. And pronounce judgment against every stubborn horn. Against every stubborn horn that has prevailed against Nigeria. Prevailed against Open Nigeria. your mouth and pray. I want you to pray now intensely. Judge in favor of Nigeria. Pronounce judgment against corruption, against terrorism, against tribalism, against nepotism, against sectorianism, against adultery. Against oppression, against wickedness, ancient of days, pronounce judgment from your throne. Let your river of fire flow through our nation, wash our nation, cleanse our nation. Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. And so shall it be. Amen. In Jesus mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Lift your hands and give him thanks for prayers answered. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to go to three people. Tell them God fills your mouth with laughter. Say this coming week. The Lord fills your mouth with laughter. May you hear good news from a far country. Just give him a shout of praise. Amen. Please be seated. Put your hands together for the choir. God is good. First, let me quickly apologize for the temperature in the, in the room. Uh, those of you who come here know that Many times you have to beg to reduce the AC. But, you know, I came in here and I heard that some of the 10 tons behind just tripped off this morning. We, we were here for workers' meeting and we had to tell them to reduce the AC. So, but I've asked them that never again should we find that on Sunday morning that stuff have gone bad. So... We will fix that before Wednesday, but I felt a sense of responsibility to apologize for that. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you are being blessed in church? Your life, you have, the, the, the choir sang the song about being changed and transformed. You are being blessed in the oasis. This is a pasture where you are being well fed and you are growing, you are covered. Amen. Okay, without further waste of time, we will go into the word and continue with our series the principles of the doctrine the principle of the doctrines of what Christ amen say the principle of the doctrines of Christ let me acknowledge um one of our mamas in the house, she's the mother to Pastor Seah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. She was here for swap last week. Amen. I'll just continue from 
where we stopped last week. Um, Pastor Y did did um, quite an amazing job laying a solid foundation and expounding the word of God on the first principle. And what is the first principle? No, I shouldn't even be waiting for people to boot. It's just, what's the first principle? Repentance from what dead works. Amen. So, and I won't spend um, time on that. We'll go over to the next principle, which is faith towards God or faith in God. Amen. And why are we sharing this? Because we have declared that 2024 is our year to go what deep into God, to assess the deep things of God, the strong meat of God. Okay. However, it would be um, unwise to seek to go deeper without, you know, making sure that our foundation is right. Amen. And I'll read a scripture from Hebrews 5.12, which speaks to that. Okay. Hebrews 5.12. It gives us a context to Hebrews 6. In fact, the whole of Hebrews 5 that was read last week lays a very good foundation for chapter 6. So let's read together. I want to go. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have needed that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So the Bible shows us that there is indeed um, areas of God or the word called what strong meat. But before that, you, we've got to ensure that we have the milk of the word of God. Just speaking to foundation. The Bible says if the foundation what be destroyed, what what? And the truth is there are many Christians, many believers who cannot even articulate clearly what they believe, what their faith is, how they have been saved, if they are truly saved, okay, where they are going, what they ought to do. And these oracles or these principles or, and doctrines of Christ are the foundation. Say foundation. Amen. Please help me with my bottle of water. You know, I've been very busy, so I need to be hydrated. Let's tell the Holy Spirit to help us this morning. Say, Holy Spirit, help us. Just speak in tongues for a few, a few seconds. When we pray in the Spirit, we stir up our spirits. We enlarge our capacity to receive. Holy Spirit of the living God, you are the teacher. I yield my members to you. I surrender my lips of clay to you. Let grace be poured on my lips. Make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. Take these words and cause it to be light and life to your people. Open our eyes to see Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Okay, I won't point out the person. There's somebody who's videoing, you know, so please make sure that you don't do that. Focus on the word of God. Okay, I hope you're not a blogger. You know, these days everything is content. You know, don't live like that. Don't try to monetize the things of God. Amen. Hebrews 6 verse 1. Hebrews 6 verse 1. Hebrews 6 verse 1. That's our context. Because of the, the, the volume of work on this particular principle, we will have it over two Sundays. It's quite extensive. And in fact, you know, oh, Pastor Owai did such an amazing work 
you know, trying to share a lot in just one Sunday. I think that probably would have been over two Sundays because, you know, there was such, so much information that she had to unpack in, 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 in just one Sunday. Amen. Let's read together. I want to go. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us Amen. Now, there are some key words there, and I'll just mention them just for definition purposes. Um, we see number one there, we see the word principle. Okay. A principle can be a fundamental law, and today I want you to write a lot, you know, because this series are more teachings than they are preaching. Amen. So, there are things you should make reference to and also watch the videos. The principle is a fundamental law, an axiom, or also a doctrine. It's also defined as a guiding sense of the requirement and obligation of right conduct. A principle is also a determining characteristics of of something, characteristic of something. Now, the, the, the Greek meaning of that word, doctrine, is, you know, application of order, it also means the commencement. It also means chief. You know, when you say that something is chief, you mean it's, it's an important thing. Amen. Another key word there we see is the word doctrine. Doctrine. Let me give you the meaning in the Greek. Doctrine, it means reasoning. It means reasoning. It means treaties. It means matter. It also means communication. But let me give you some definition that I put together. A doctrine is a body of scriptural teachings and truth. Say, a body of scriptural teachings and truth utilized in the training and shaping of believers into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'll take it again. A, a, a doctrine is a body of scriptural teachings and truths utilized in the training and shaping of believers into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me make it easier for us. A doctrine is what we may call a spiritual syllabus or curriculum. Do you understand? A spiritual syllabus or curriculum. You know, when you are going to schools, um, say private schools and maybe primary schools, they make use of what? A curriculum. There are people who use what? The British curriculum, Canadian curriculum, American curriculum, and, and that body of information and, and system of teachings is supposed to train you to, to be a particular way to think in a particular way. Amen. So, depending on what a, a, a parent desires for a child, on where they think the child is going, they send them to certain places to be trained in that manner. Amen. 
for example, I know that the way the British um, curriculum works, they, they, they focus a lot on critical you know, um, analysis, critical thinking. You know, I did, I have, I, I, I studied, I've done a few things with British schools, and the curriculum is meant to, to in, in, increase and, you know, your critical thinking skills, because they are an evidence-based society. Amen. So also, a doctrine is a body of truth, you know, you, utilized in training, in discipleship. Amen. And what is the aim? To make us become like Christ. Amen. Do we understand? So the principles of the doctrine of Christ are the foundational principles of Christianity. They are the foundational principles of Christianity. And like I've said, if the foundations, the foundation be destroyed, there's little that you can, you know, achieve as a Christian. You know, those with shaky foundations are those who are tossed to and fro. Those the devil can easily pray, deceive. They are the foundational principles of Christianity. They have been given by Jesus Christ to all Christians. Amen. These principles are made up of the doctrine that was given to God, the Son, Jesus, by God the Father. John 7, 16. John 7, 16. Can I get someone to stay with me on the keys? John 7, 16. Let's read together. We're going to read quite a number of scriptures together. One to go. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Amen. Amen. And the doctrine of Christ is, is established not just in word, but also in power. In power. Say in power. Luke 4.32. Luke 4.32. In other words, these principles are empowering. You know, um, when we know the truth, the truth sets us free. When we know the truth, the truth empowers us. There is a popular saying that knowledge is what? Power. Amen. And they were what? Astonished at his doctrine. For his word was what? With powers. Amen. So when believers don't know these principles, they are not empowered. So this is, this series are really, you know, sessions of empowerment. Empowering you with truths, with your rights. In Christ Jesus. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 1 5 says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, also, but in power and in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's see Isaiah 28, verse 9. Let's see Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are what weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Amen. So, if you are a Christian who desires to grow in Christ Jesus, these truths are inescapable. They are unavoidable. So, this is a very, very important series in your, in your journey with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So last week we spoke on repentance and that word, another key word, repentance in the Greek is, is called metanoia, means a deep sense of remorse. Say a deep sense of remorse. I want you to write this down again. Repentance is first a deep sense of remorse. You know, so the Bible talks about godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. There must be that deep sense of remorse that, you know, arises from, you know, conviction by the Holy Spirit. You know, convicting us of sin or righteousness and of judgment. 
So when that happens, there is what we call godly sorrow. So that's what I, I term that deep sense of remorse and regret, you know, and self-actualization. You know, is 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 seeing yourself for what it is and really feeling bad about it, not in a negative way. You know, it's called godly sorrow. The Bible says that godly sorrow leads what? To repentance. Godly sorrow. There is an ungodly sorrow which is called condemnation. Condemnation makes you feel you are not good enough. Makes you feel like you are a failure. Makes you feel like you cannot make it. But godly sorrow you know, is, is positive. It comes upon you. It, it, it stirs up, it stirred up by the Holy Spirit within you. And the assignment of godly sorrow is to drive you to make a decision. Say to make a decision. So a deep sense of remorse accompanied by reversal of direction. Say by reversal of direction. In repentance, there has to be a turning back. Pastor Oh, I shared that. I'm laying this because it, it ties straight in to faith in God. Amen. So, repentance is not, oh God, you know this, I messed up, and then staying there. Repentance is, oh my goodness, you cry, you weep, you feel bad, and then you change direction. Say change direction. It must be accompanied by a change of direction. And finally, a change in thinking. Say a change in thinking. To repent is to change the way that you think. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so what? Amen. So there's got to be a change of thinking preceded by what? A change of direction preceded by what? A deep sense of remorse. Do we understand? So, if you've just been feeling bad, and Papa Sowai mentioned something that as an unsaved person, you repent and then put your, your trust in God, which is a subject for today. But as a believer, every now and then we err like a, like a, a normal relationship. Okay? And repentance in that sense. It's like apologizing and changing your mind. Do you understand? You know, every now and then you find people, you know, who, who, who when they fall, believe us now, they think that you have to come out for an altar call every time. When, when you hurt your spouse, do you marry them every other time to make up? Do you do that? What do you do? You apologize. And it becomes painful when you are apologizing and you are doing the same thing again. You know that. It becomes frustrating. After a while, that apology loses what? Value. It becomes like, okay, you are what? Sorry. In fact, they'll, ec they'll echo with you, darling, I'm sorry. Okay. And then become sarcastic about it. But repentance is remorse, self-actualization, and then you do what? You turn away. Do we understand? It must be accompanied by a reversal. Let's look at scripture. Acts 26 verse 20. Are we learning? Make sure you are writing. These are the basics of faith. These are the basics, the principles of our faith. Let's read together. One to go. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then toward the Gentiles that they should what? Repent. Repent and do what? Turn. Say repent and turn. And then do works meet for repentance. Amen. So repentance is to is to is is a deep sense of remorse, self-actualization, a change of direction, a change of thinking. And then as we see, do works meet for repentance. Amen. So repentance is, write this down, is the turning away from sin while faith in God is the turning unto God. 
Say repentance is the turning away from sin, from Satan, from darkness. And then the second principle, faith in God, is the turning unto God. Amen. So there must first be a turning away from, which we call repentance, before there is a turning unto. Amen. Which we call faith in God. Hallelujah. Do we understand? The Bible says, we see a, an Old Testament um, equivalent there. In Deuteronomy 6.23. Deuteronomy 6.23. It says, and he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in. Say, he brought us out that he might bring us in. Say, he brought us out that he might bring us in. And I'm going to share the, the, the implication of this. Okay. So, repentance is turning away from and faith in God is turning to. Do we understand? So, it's like saying, if I'm heading towards Aja, before I go to VI, which is opposite, I have to stop what going to Aja. I need to turn away from Aja because I cannot be in Aja and Victoria Island at the same time. I will just I will share the implication of that shortly. But let me give you a few scriptures. Acts 14 15. Acts 14 15. Acts 14 15. Do we understand what repentance is now? Okay. Acts 14 15. And saying, Sars, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should what? Turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth. Amen. So there must be a turning away from. That's very important. It, it sounds, you know, like I'm repeating myself, but it is very vital. It is very important if you would really experience the new life in full. Matthew 21, 32. Matthew 21, 32. Matthew. Let's read. One, two. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye when ye had seen him, repented not after that ye might believe. You see, if you don't repent, you can't believe. If you don't turn, you can't have faith towards God. Let me give you one more. Mark 1, 14 to 15. Mark 1, 14 to 15. Mark 1, 14 to 15. I'm taking this time before I get into faith in God. If somebody is sleeping, tell the person repent. I know, I know we are not used to teachings as, you know, as Africans. We like, <coughs> but this is what makes you. The word of grace that is able to build you up. Discipleship comes by training and teaching. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And the message of the gospel of the kingdom is what? Repent. Change your mind. Turn away from your sin. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom is at hand. Repent ye. What? And believe. Hallelujah. Now, what's the implication of this? Of this statement? Is that there are believers who claim to have faith in God who are still practicing and living and bearing the same attributes and characteristics of their past. They claim that they are born again, but they have the same old friends. They still go to the same old parties. They still talk the way they talk. And they still do the same things they do. But claim to have what? Faith in God. 
Repentance is to turn away from the vanities of darkness. Amen. Today somebody will repent. Someone will truly repent. Because as, as we share these things, you will begin to examine your faith. Am I truly saved? Am I truly saved? So that all of this won't be a facade, a waste of time. And you think you are saved. But you are not. There must be a turning away from. And the Bible says to do the works meet for repentance. There, there are obvious fruits that we should bear if we truly claim to have our faith in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't keep cutting corners, you know, forging documents like you used to do and claim to now have faith in God. Hallelujah. Now let's move to the principle of faith in God. Say faith in God. Faith in God. So now that we have repented, we have what? Faith in God. Let's look at the word faith. What is faith? What is faith? We'll give you the Bible or biblical definition. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Say now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic. Please help me with the Amplified Classic. Now, faith is the substance of things. Do we have it? He says, now, faith is the assurance. Say assurance. Note that word, assurance. In brackets, what? The confirmation. Say the confirmation. The title deed. I have explained this in church before. How many of you remember that, you know, I think I used a wedding ceremony that say on your wedding day, um, maybe your parent or someone comes to present a gift of a landed property to you. That they don't need to come with the house physically to present on that day or to take you or to pull you out of your wedding reception to the place to present the gift that they can bring to you what a document and by giving you that document they have given you what a house now that title deed is symbolic of the house you can't live in the document but with that title deed you can safely say what you own a house now faith is like that title deed it is the substance of things not seen you know of hope for and the evidence of what things not seen so that title deed becomes what your evidence in fact if that title deed is confirmed to be what original even without seeing the property you can go ahead to you know what to a bank you know to apply for a loan for a collateral all right but you've not even seen the house yet and that your belief is based on something. Oh, I'm jumping ahead of my time, but let me give you now. Now, if, if, the, if the security guards, and I don't say that to demean anybody, you know them, or whatever. Maybe it's just a, uh, a domestic worker, or your domestic worker at home came to you during your wedding reception and said to you, Olga, oh thank you. You don't help me well, well, you've helped me. To say thank you, this is a title deed for a house in Banana Island. What would you say? Are you okay? Do you understand? You think it's a skit or a prank. Why? Because faith is not just the title deed. Faith is who is giving you the title deed. Do you understand? I was, not, uh, I was not going to go there, but I had to rush there. I'll come back there again. So, the Bible says that faith is that assurance, that confirmation, that title deed, 
that document of a car that you received even without seeing the physical car hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses amen hallelujah the greek meaning of faith is the word pistis it means persuasion you see persuasion conviction assurance those words faith is an assurance amen it's also religious truth or truthfulness especially the reliance upon Christ for salvation and that's a, a theme for today faith can also be the system of religious belief so for example you say okay what's your faith my faith is what I'm a Christian so but that's not what we're talking about now we're talking about faith as a substance as an evidence today Faith is belief. Say, say faith is belief. Faith is fidelity. But today we are not just talking about faith towards God, referring to faith as the fruit of the Spirit, nor faith as the gift of the Spirit. You know, there's the gift of faith. There's the spirit of faith. We're not talking about that today. But we are talking about faith as a substance and evidence of our belief in God. Write this down. Let me share with you in, in bullet points some important things about faith. Faith begins by believing that God exists. Say faith believe. Say faith begins by believing that God exists. That is the starting point of faith. Hebrews 11, 6. Hebrews 11, 6. Hebrews 11, 6. That is the starting point of faith. So faith is not believing in the promise or in the title deed like I explained now. Because some any, anybody can give you a title deed. But who gave you the title deed is what makes you believe. Do you understand? So faith begins that first God exists. Say God exists. Hebrews 11, 6. Let's read. Want to go. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Why? Because the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And we'll get there in the second part of this. The, the Christian work is a life of faith. It's a life of faith. That is a major distinguishing factor of the believer and the unbeliever because we live our lives based on faith we live by faith and not by sight say we live by faith and not by sight what do i mean sight sight your five senses sight, sight means your five senses your flesh living based on the drive of the five senses Making decisions based on what you see, what you taste, what you feel, what you hear, and what, what? What's the other one? Five senses. What you smell. Amen. That's living by sight. Judging things by sight. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord will come on Jesus. Why? Because he shall not judge by the seeing of his sight. So that's a distinguishing factor between a believer. So don't always feel bad if you are believing God and it does not seem you know, evident to the natural eye and they think you are crazy. That's our life. For we look not at the things that are seen because the things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen are what? Eternal. That's how we live. That's the life Jadel sang a song years ago. He said, this is our culture. This is our what? Heritage. We live by faith. Say we live by faith. And not by sight. So, but faith, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God 
must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's read from the Amplified. 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 Amplified helps us. This is very important. Let's read together. I want to go. But without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. So that is, you know, where faith begins from, from God. Let, let me also add that faith originates from Jesus. More specifically, faith originates from Jesus. It's the same point as faith, you know, we must believe that God exists. But more specifically, it begins from Jesus. And you see what I mean. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Hope you are writing. Hope you are learning. Want to go. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with what? So great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto what? Jesus, the author. What does author mean? The originator. The starting point. And the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. We will learn so much about faith originating from Jesus. In fact, there could be no faith in God without having faith in Jesus. And I'll explain what that means. Another scripture, Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Still buttressing the faith that, the fact that faith originates from God. And I'll tie this point up shortly. So then, faith cometh how? By hearing. And hearing what? The word of God. Say faith originates from God. Say faith comes from God. Say Jesus is the author of faith. And he's the finisher of faith. Now what's the implication of this? The implication is that faith therefore is not merely a mental ascent. You know every now and then you listen to motivational speech and I'm not talking about pastors now like, like me, people who inspire you can do it wake up in the morning look at yourself in the mirror and go out in the day and then you feel this ginger faith is not ginger faith is not that it's not positive thinking amen because faith has to be dependent on you know uh, on, on God on something bigger and higher than you. And hope you know that everybody has faith. Everyone has faith. I'm going to demonstrate it now. Give me that chair. Give me my chair. Give me my chair. Please give me that, that chair very quickly. Oh, I, I forgot to get this. Okay, give me this saxophone. Don't worry, I won't spoil it. No, no, that sax box. Amen. I need um, a lady to come to me. A lady. Okay, let me let me have a lady that has more weight than I, amen. <laughs> I'm just joking. Come, come. Because of my points. Hope you know that this is the this is what a lot of people are praying for. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, faith is therefore not merely a mental ascent. Say, it's not a mental ascent. It's not ginger. It's not that thing. You're not saying to yourself, I can do it. It is not just some isolated conviction by itself. Write this down. Faith is not an isolated conviction by itself. 
Faith is a persuasion, assurance, confidence, and trust that stems from the character and quality of a thing or a person. Do we understand? It's the same point I'm making about the person who gave you the title deed. It's not just about the title deed. Amen. The title deed may actually be original, but sometimes you will doubt it because of the person who gave you. Do you understand what I mean? So faith is not just ginger. Why is it important? Because many people have made decisions based on ginger, thinking that God told them. Do we understand what I mean? How many of you took decisions you thought because of the drive you felt and you thought it was God and you found out it was not God? Let me find out. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, that's what I sit down. Amen. Did you see that? She didn't think that's why please sit down there. <laughs> now, this is what I wanted to get. Do you see her, her expression? She didn't have that when it was this seat because she trusts the character of this chair. As soon as it was this, she questioned her sitting down because faith is dependent on on what what you are leaning on put your hands together please help me do you know that let me give you an example i've said it before there are people who when they're about to fly for example they're about to fly to benin 25 minutes flight on the nigerian world and on a Nigerian airline, I'm not saying an airline are, are bad. Sometimes, and in fact, I even heard that when it comes to safety, our guys are even better because the parameters are even higher because they know we know ourselves. So sometimes when they tell you there are some checks that we demand more in Nigeria that I hear that people don't even demand because of the weakness of our character. And you see, when character is weak, faith will, faith will be weak. That's a big point. When character of a thing or of a person is weak, faith in that thing will be weak. But thank God we have a God who does not lie. God who cannot lie. That's why he's what? Dependable. So when people, I find it every time, when people are about to travel, local flight, it's even shorter. There is a sobriety. There is a calmness. There is a perceived sanctity, sanctimonious expression that people have. But I found those same people, they are on Delta Airline, flying over the Atlantic for 12 hours, or going to London BA for 6 hours. They are gisting. Hey, how are you? Because of the character of Nigerians. Am I making a point? Do you understand faith now? So that faith is not just that you have money, you can travel, but it is dependent on who is who, who, who are you flying with? And every now and then, I get on those flights, once a pilot even just coughs, <coughs> um, maybe on a Nigerian flight, and it's not even anything serious. Well, um, just tighten your seatbelt, we're going to be going through a little bit of a rough air. Say, Father, we thank you. Shaba Eke. Rebe, be, be, be. And it's just a normal, it's not even a, a, a medium level. It's just maybe the first grade. But those same people are on BA. And there's a serious turbulence. They are still at rest because they are like, this is BA. This is triple seven. Do you know who is the captain of your destiny? The champion of. Oh, stop. He's the captain, he's the one on at the cockpit. My destiny in you alone, 
in you alone I make my bones you reign now so if truly he is the captain of our destiny why then are we anxious why are we scared why, why, why do we easily get overwhelmed you know why because it's not yet a conviction in our heart. It's just a head knowledge. The day this reality settles in our spirit, there will be a confidence because faith is a confidence, is a persuasion. Say so faith is a confidence. It's a persuasion. So in summary to this point I've given you, write this down. Three very important things. Faith is believing God. God is. Faith is believing that God can. And faith is believing God that God will. Say faith is believing that God is. In other words, that he's who he says he is. It stems from knowing that God is God. He cannot lie. He cannot change. Therefore, he's dependable. He's sure. And then faith is believing God. Is believing that God can. It's still that Hebrews 11 verse 6. That he that come must believe that God is and that he's a rewarder. That he can. That he will. The Bible says that he's the finisher of our faith. In other words, that God begins that God sustains and that God completes. Faith is believing that God can start it, can sustain it and can believe it. When it becomes a truth in your spirit, then you can walk through life victorious. Are you blessed already? Now, Let's look at faith in God as I begin to round off. Faith in God. Now, do you know that the Jews have faith in God? In Judaism, there's faith in God, in Yahweh. The Jews believe in the God of our Father, Jesus Christ. Do you know that there are other religions who believe in God? You know that? Yeah, they believe. But the difference for us is that faith in God is essentially faith in Christ. Write that down. So, this teaching is divided into two parts, two major parts. So, the first part is saved through faith, which is what I'm trying to tie off now. And the second part is living by faith. Or we say faith for salvation or faith for living. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, faith, when we talk about faith in God, we're essentially talking about faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in God is believing in God. Write that down. Is it believing in God? And believing in God is to place confidence and trust in God. Let me write that. Let me say it again. Faith in God, you know, I missed everything I've said, is believing in God, you know, based on the conviction, the persuasion that, you know, I described now. Faith in God is to believe in God. Believing in God is to place your confidence and trust in God. Now, belief and confidence in God is through Christ Jesus through Christ Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus what is what? The way, the truth, and he's the life. He's the God sanctioned way access and route to the Father. Say Jesus is the God sanctioned way access and route to the Father. 1 Timothy 2.5 1 Timothy 2.5 
First Timothy 2 5. For there is what? Let's read. One to go. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Amen. There is nothing diplomatically correct about this. There is nothing inclusive about this. I mean, it, it sounds tough to other religions. You know, and sometimes you want to try to see things with them. But the word of God says that what there is only one what mediator. He is the way, what the truth and the life. You see, the New Testament is based on faith in Christ. Say faith in Christ. That's what the New Testament is based on. As opposed to trying to fulfill the requirements of the law yourself to be justified in the sight of God. You see, the Jews in Judaism, the idea is to try to, you know, you know fulfill the, 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 the law of Moses, to do the works of the law so that they can be accepted in the sight of God. And the Bible shows us, as I will show you, from scriptures that it's impossible it's impossible to be made right with God to be justified in the sight of God by trying to fulfill the works of the law by the works of the law I'm speaking about the, the mosaic legal code you know rules as found in the Torah the Pentateuch the, the, the first you know um, five book is the Torah okay all of those 600 plus rules and regulations because it's not given to man to keep them let's look at some scriptures together no man can be saved by trying to keep the law please give me romans 3 20 to 24 in the new living translation romans 3 20 to 24 this truth is central to your Christian work. Every believer must be able to understand this. You may not be able to articulate it so fluently, but at least you must know it in your spirit. What it means to be saved. What it means to put your faith in God. Faith in God as a New Testament believer is to, to put your faith in Christ. I'm going to define it shortly. Can we all read together? Because this is gold for you. One to go. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's what the, the job of the law was to show us how sinful we are and to show us a need for a savior. The, the job of the law as seen in Galatians 3.19 was like a stopgap until the one who was promised to come comes. So God gave us the law intentionally to point to our sin. An example is if you drive on the Lekki Ekpe Express Road and there is no speed limit. As long as there is no speed limit, we can't say that you've broken the law, right? But as soon as there is a signpost there saying 80 and you're on 85 or 90, you know you are at variance with the law. That's what the law did. That's what the law did. It was just to show us our sin. In itself, it had no power to declare us righteous. Let's continue. But now, say but now. God has shown us what? A way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. You know those requirements? You know when you are, um, when you touch an animal, you can't do this. When a woman is, you know, going through a period, she's away from this. All of that, you know, you find in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all Deuteronomy, a lot of rules. There's no way you could because the, the way the law works is either you fulfill all or you fail in all. If you, if you kept 99% of it and failed 1%, you failed. How many people want to have that kind of exam? Where you've done everything right and then just this little dot you didn't put, you said you failed. Ah. That's the law for you. You walked out the formula, you gave everything, but you just failed to put a dot and they say repeat. There are some courses where even 49% is pass mark, you know that. 
then 99%. That's what the law was to us. That's what the law was. Let's read one to go. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and prophets long ago. Continue. We are made right with God by placing our faith in who? You see, in God, in Jesus Christ. Why is this important? Anybody who did not come, who has not placed his faith in Jesus Christ is not saved. No matter the God they call. It has to be what? In Jesus Christ. Why Jesus Christ? You will see that. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. No matter who we are, meaning whether Jew or Gentiles. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But see, the first day you were born, you were a sinner. You didn't abuse anybody, but just by coming out from that lineage of sin, you are a sinner. For all have sinned and come short. When we understand the gospel, worship is easier. When you know what Jesus did. Amen. Let's read this one to go. Yet, God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this how? Through. That's why we love Jesus. Through what? Wow. Lift your hands and thank him. Say thank you Jesus. Say thank you Jesus. That through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Verse 25, verse 25. For God presented Jesus Christ as the sacrifice. So, that, those, that law had to be fulfilled. All of the requirements of the law had to be fulfilled. But there was only one who was able to fulfill it. And that was Jesus Christ. The only sinless person. The only perfect one. That's why God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name. He, he, he became obedient unto death. He took upon himself her sins. That's the gospel. So, believing in that whole sacrifice, that experience of his on the cross eh, is what brings salvation. That's what it means to have faith in God. Let's read this. This is very important. Want to go? For God, guys, guys, I say read. Want to go? For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice of sin. People are made right. In other words, declared righteous. Declared righteous means that God has declared you, you, you are in right standing with him. He has now approved you. He's declared you holy. What? When they believed, what? That Jesus Christ sacrificed his life shedding his blood this sacrifice shows that God was being fair amen that's that's what it means that's what it means to put our faith in God putting our faith in God is putting our faith in Jesus Christ in his atoning work is believing and accepting and personalizing it that this sacrifice was for me and I believe it. And I place my confidence, my trust in him. Ah, oh my goodness. Jesus is so good. I say he's so good. Oh, celebrate him. He's so good. Because no one can be justified by the law. Galatians 3.11. Galatians 3.11. And Galatians 3.19. Let me show you that. No man. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scripture says, it is true faith that a righteous person has life. So we call this life the faith life or the spirit life. Now, we will talk about this next week in the part B. Today we are talking about salvation through faith. You know, faith for salvation. 
Now, after we are saved, we will see from Galatians 3, when Paul told the Jews, he says, how can you who, um, what's that scripture? Give me Galatians 3. He may, I mean, he said, you've seen, it was before you that Jesus Christ, you know, verse 1, was, was, was crucified. You know, you know, oh foolish Galatians, who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? You know, before whose eyes Jesus had been evidently set forth crucified. In other words, you have been saved through faith. Now, why are you trying to live the life? Go to verse 3. Why are you trying to be made perfect? Are you so foolish having begun? In other words, having been saved by the Spirit. Every now and then, you see that word by the Spirit, by faith, interchangeably. Okay, because the New Testament life is the life lived by the Spirit or is a life lived by faith. It's the same thing. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? So this is for next week. Amen. Because after we are saved through faith, there is living the life by faith. And after we live the life by faith, we will finally overcome by faith. The Bible says he's the finisher of our faith. You will learn next week that the life, living the life by faith is simply a life dependent on the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit-led life. Or the one, or what we call the way of faith. So that when somebody hears the gospel, what is sometimes called the hearing of faith, and decides to place his confidence and trust in what Christ has done, he is saved. That's what it means to place your faith in God. Philippians 3 verse 3. Philippians 3 verse 3. Philippians 3 verse 3. Philippians 3 verse 3. For we are what? The circumcision. You know, circumcision is the cutting away of the foreskin, you know, of the male organ. But in the New Testament, it's, it's, it's the circumcision of the hearts. Amen. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ and have what? No confidence in the flesh, in the works of the law, in our five senses. We are led by the spirit. We are dependent on God. Amen. Romans 2.29. Romans 2.29. Do you understand what it means now to put your faith in God? Is to put your faith in Jesus, in all, in all that He did, in His atoning work. But He is a Jew, which is inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men. Give me the NLT quickly. Give me the NLT quickly. NLT. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. You see? Rather, it is a change of heart produced what? By the Spirit. And a person with what? A change heart seeks praise from God, not man. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. First Corinthians, are you seeing? So, you are the true Jew. Say you are a true Jew. Yeah, because you put, you don't put your confidence in flesh. You believe in the Messiah. We are, we are, we are called the spiritual Jew, the true Jew. Amen. And because of that, we 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 have access to the blessing of Abraham because he is the father of the way of faith. Say, Abraham is the father of the way of faith and we are are closing by reading through that to show you because you can't talk about the the faith life the spirit led life without talking about the father of faith the pioneer of faith that that oh I think it's 2 Corinthians 3.17 2 Corinthians 3.17 have you learned something this morning do you understand what it means to put your faith in God now this Lord is what that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is what? There is liberty. Verse 18. But we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed 
through the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You will learn next week that, you know, the, the, the inheritance of the saints, the promise that was, you know, um, given us was packaged in the person of the Holy Spirit. When Paul asked the Galatians, did you receive the Holy Spirit by fulfilling the, the demands of the law? No, no, no. You received the Holy Spirit by believing in, you know, by faith in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Say, I believe in Jesus. That's why you are a Christian, Christ, Christocentric, Christian. But unfortunately, we talk, as Christians, we talk about everything else but Christ and what he has done. Amen. But in this house, you will know what he has done for you. So write this down as a closing thought on, on this. Therefore, faith in God is really faith in Christ as the Messiah the son of God and in his atoning and redemptive walk on the cross. And let me tell you how this is activated. Because faith is not just a conviction. It's not just a persuasion. The faith cycle is not complete until there is a declaration we believe and therefore we speak remember I'm speaking about faith for salvation and then I'm going to make a call because based on what I've said if you judge your salvation experience and these elements are not there chances are that you did not really believe let me say that again therefore faith in God is really faith in Christ as what? The Messiah, the promised one. That's why the Jews are not saved because they have not accepted Jesus. Every time we go to Jerusalem, they say, oh, he was a carpenter, I lived there, the mother lived there. They see him as just a human being. Because their picture of the Messiah, you know, is someone like a Superman, a Voltron, who will just come gang gang and deliver them who was supposed to come and hijack them and deliver them from the rule of the Romans and fight their enemy but he came as a lamb to be slain he had no form or comeliness he was born in a manger and then all of a sudden he, you, know, you know he said he would die how can you be the Messiah now it's easy to laugh at the Jews but if you and I were in their day come on but it's always God's strategy to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Had the prince of this world known, he wouldn't what? Crucify. Our faith is a mystery. Acts 20, 20 to 21. Are you blessed? And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house. Verse 21. Testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward what? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in God is faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Son of God and in his atoning work of redemption and salvation on the cross. It's on that basis that God declares us righteous. Romans 4. Romans 4. Finally, Romans 4. Let's read about Abraham. We're just going to read NLT. We're just going to read and then I'll show you some things there. Everybody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank him. When, when you understand his reality, you thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Let's read one to go. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, 
he would have had something to boast about. But hope you know that before the law came, Abraham came. Amen. Before the, the, the Mosaic law, Abraham existed before what? But God had declared him what? Righteous, even before the law came. So we see that righteousness with God was not something he wanted to achieve by the law. The law was just there to show us our wrong and to point us to the coming Savior. Amen. Do we understand it? This is where your Christianity is hinged on. No? This is what makes you a Christian. The, these are elementary principles of our faith. Let's go. For the scripture tells us, Abraham what? Believed God. And God counted him righteous because of his faith. You will learn next week that the ultimate expression of belief is obedience you see somewhere else Hebrews 11 verse 7 you know and then a little later on that Abraham obeyed God and offered up what Isaac the ultimate proof that you believe is obedience says obedience so it's not just a mental ascent show me your faith and I'll show you what my own faith what with works Put the scripture when people do what work for wages i'm sorry their wages are not a gift but something they earn is that not true if you work for me and i give you a salary am i doing you a favor no 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 you've earned it you have a right to earn that money so if i don't pay you you can take me to court right but go people are counted I want you to read with me. R counted righteous. Not because of their work. But because of their faith in God. Who forgives sinners. Continue. David also spoke of this. When he described the happiness. Of those. Who are declared righteous. Without working for it. Oh what joy. For those whose disobedience is forgiven. They are quoting David now. Side. Continue. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now, is this blessing only for Jews? Or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? No. Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. Continue. But how did this happen? Very good. It's good to know the how. Say how. Yes. We, it's good to know what, but the how is what empowers us. Let's go. Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised? No. Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. That you know, circumcision, the cutting off of the first king, okay, as a sign, you know, that God possesses you, that God owns you. So, the Bible is saying to us that God did not ask him to do that to be declared righteous. And that this is why. Let's go. Circumcision was a mere sign that Abraham had already had faith in and, and declared him righteous. So, what's an equivalent for us here? When we serve God, and obey God and do things for God. You are not doing that to be accepted. That's the truth there. Put your hands together for Jesus. Because when you have that mentality, you, you know you have a law mentality. For example, when you give your tithe, you are not really giving it to be blessed. You are already blessed. Yes, it's a principle of the kingdom. You give it as your expression of love. When you serve God, if you have at the back of mind, as I'm serving him, you do this for me. You don't understand what Christ has done. Those are just responses to what he has already done. You are already accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. Abraham already had faith 
and that God what had already accepted him. Let's read together. It's for everybody. And declared him to be righteous. Say, I am righteous. That's if you are born. That's if you place your trust in Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to give someone an opportunity now to be righteous. Even before he was circumcised. So Abraham what? Is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. Is that you? Is that you? Is that you? That's why we sing Father Abraham. See, Abraham is my father. That's why Galatians 3 says that the blessing of Abraham may come to what the Gentiles through faith. You have access to the blessing of Abraham if you are born again. They are counted righteous because of their faith. Continue. Quick, 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 quick. Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised. In other words, the Jews, the Jews who have been circumcised, but if only they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before. This is a statement that the Jews can kill you for. Like, you mean we are not children of Abraham? Who, how do you mean? But Paul says, if you have faith, the same kind of faith, if you place your faith in Christ Jesus, then can you truly be the offspring of Abraham? Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham, continue, and his descendants was based not on his obedience to the law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. And that faith is faith in Christ Jesus. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. Continue. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. Like I gave you with the word road. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. You see that? That is what the scriptures mean. When God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened when Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Continue. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God has said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Continue. And Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though at 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing in God's promises. The fact, in fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever. Remember what I said, that faith being connected to the personality. So, your, the strength of your faith is based on the knowledge of your God. Say the strength of your faith is contingent upon the knowledge of your God. For they that know their God. If you don't know God, you won't have faith. He was fully convinced that God is able. Remember I said faith is believing that God is and that God can and that God will to do whatever word he promises. And because Abraham's faith, of Abraham's faith, God counted him what? As righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded. Guess what? For, for your benefit. Say my benefit. Assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Put your hands together. Can we stand? Can we stand? Can we stand, everybody? Can we stand? Lift your hands and give him thanks. Thank him. I want you to thank him. Thank him. Thank him. He said it was not just for Abraham. Put that last two scripture. He said, if we believe in the one who raised him from the dead, say, I believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Now I'm going to make a very important call. An important call. If you are here this morning, and you are not sure 
based on what we have learned today that you put your faith in God remember we said faith in God begins by what? repentance deep sense of remorse a reversal of direction and doing works meet for repentance that faith in God is faith in Christ as the son of God as a messiah in his atoning work believing and receiving that what he did on the cross was for you and placing your trust there then God declares you righteous righteous means to be approved by God justified means just as though you've never seen and as he's able the Bible says unto Jude 124 unto him that is able to keep you from falling to present you blameless or faultless before the presence of his glory verse 25 give me the KJV to the only wise God our Savior you see our Savior who is the Savior Jesus be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore every eye closed head bowed you are here you are not sure that you are truly saved and you want to make it sure today and what do I mean by being saved that you have repented so if you are here you are claiming to have repented but you are still full blown doing the things you used to do having the same friends you used to have the same appetites and you've not put your trust in God and it's only by putting our trust in God that the faith and the grace needed to live the life is released Romans 10 8 to 10 Romans 8 sorry 10 8 to 10 but what said it the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which we preach this is the word of faith I preach today that if thou shalt confess with your mouth this is how we activate our trust in God our faith in God this is how we activate it if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved every eye closed everybody close your eyes if you are here you want to say Pastor Nathaniel I want to be truly saved and something will happen to you today I want to become a, a bona fide child of Abraham I want to make sure that I'm not just going to church that I have believed the gospel and that I have put my trust in God without shame it doesn't matter if you thought you were saved this is the spirit of the Lord making this call you want to truly see a change and transformation in your life I want you to raise your hand everybody raise if you are that person raise your hands you want to make that decision for Jesus Christ you want to be sure this is an important time this is a defining moment for someone's life I want you to wave it that's right wave it don't be ashamed even if you think you were saved I've explained it faith for salvation now those of you waving your hands as the people clap I want you to rush forward clap if the Holy Spirit is saying get up if you hear a voice saying you should go once you come you will be saved once you come you will be saved that voice saying don't go is the devil come and make it sure come and be sure this is what it's about. Come. That's right. Yes. Come and put your faith in Christ Jesus. There are other there are people who should be here who are not here. Keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping. See what the Lord has done. Pastor Nathaniel, I'm not sure. I think you are here. If you are not, if you doubt it, it means you need to come. And when you come, that, that uncertainty will just fizzle out. Come to Jesus. This is the life of faith. Come to Jesus. 
oh i think i've been saved for long but i'm not seeing the changes maybe the grace is not at work in you come to jesus don't be ashamed don't be ashamed when you come he releases grace come to jesus that's right that's right come to jesus your hands and thank you you see what happens when we preach the gospel now those of you in front say with me Lord Jesus say Lord Jesus I come to you today see you have to say it and believe it. say I come to you today I believe okay you are still coming come 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 say I believe that you are the son of God today I repent of my sins I turn away from my past and I place my faith in Jesus I confess you Jesus as my Lord and Savior I declare that you came in the flesh I declare that you died and you rose again wash me in your blood I declare that on the authority of your word on the authority of your word I am born again my sins are forgiven I'm a child of Abraham I'm a child of God I am forgiven I receive grace to walk by faith to live for you in Jesus name put your hands together for the Lord father I declare all these ones saved and their sins forgiven in jesus mighty name we have prayed please come and help please go with that sister go with that sister put your hands together for the lord give him a shout of praise